Should we go ahead and get started? Okay. I think we'll uh, go ahead and get started. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, Lauren Riesberg. Uh, Lauren got his master's in botany at the University of Tennessee and then got his PhD also in botany uh, from Washington State University. His first faculty appointment was at Claremont Graduate School and he's currently a distinguished professor in the Department of Biology at Indiana University and the Canada Research Chair in Plant Evolutionary Genomics at the University of British Columbia. And uh, Lauren and his lab focus uh, mostly on speciation in the genus Helianthus, which includes the domesticated sunflower. Uh, also on the role of hybridization and speciation, which I think we're going to hear a lot about today. And uh, domestication in general of sunflower. And Lauren and his lab are currently working on uh, the sunflower genome. Uh, Lauren has received numerous awards, uh, very prestigious. He's officially a genius. Uh, he's uh, gotten the MacArthur uh, Fellowship, uh, which is also known as the Genius Grant. Uh, he's also gotten the Guggenheim Fellowship and the Stebbins Medal. And most recently, as of last week, he's joined kind of a rarefied group, including Haldane and Fisher, uh, in receiving the Darwin Wallace Medal from the Linnaean Society of London uh, for his contribution in evolutionary biology. So join me in welcoming Lauren Riesberg. So I, um, I'm wearing a microphone because I sort of uh, carried, I have a two-year-old and she gave me a cold just before I headed to London and so it's, my voice hasn't entirely recovered. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Good. Um, I want to thank Matt for that very gracious introduction. I, I, I should mention that when I went to London to the Linnaean Society, I didn't realize I was supposed to say anything other than thank you. And so, um, but everyone else, there were a couple of other, several other people receiving various medals. They seemed to, to like to give out medals. And, and so they, before me, and they made these nice speeches. And so I thought that I should make a speech. And I got up there and I, I, they had talked about my work on hybridization, which I'm actually not going to talk about today. Um, um, a little bit, but not much. Um, and so I, I thought, well, um, so I said that, mentioned that Linnaeus was the first to um, suggest that new, that new species arose via hybridization, and he was right. But then I didn't stop there. I thought a bit more about it. I was jet lagged, and I said, but Linnaeus was entirely wrong about, um, mostly wrong about this, um, because, and then I realized I was just trashing Linnaeus in front of the <laughs> Linnaean Society, and I, uh, quickly finished my remarks and moved on, but um, do not ever make an unprepared speech when you've had no sleep in the last 24 hours. It's not a good idea. Um, and I thought about telling them what I really meant. Um, and if anyone wants to know, I'll tell you later. Um, but I realized I was just going down the wrong track. Um, I want to thank everyone for those who, in, in, for uh, selecting me as the, the lecturer um, for the story lecture. It's a great um, honor. Um, particularly because it is UC Davis, and um, I view UC Davis as having the strongest uh, program in ecology and evolution in North America, and so it's a real honor for that reason. Also, um, it's an intimidating uh, group to talk to as well um, because of the um, large number of very uh, um, good thinkers here. I also want to thank Matt for organizing the visit. It's been, very, uh, it's been a great visit so far. And, and finally, just to say something about the title, um, I'm mostly talking about plant speciation. I included animals in the title just to get the zoologist to come. I have some pictures there, too. Um, there will be, I'll say, one or two things about animals as we go along, so I'm not going to leave you out entirely, but um, it is mostly about plants. And I thought I would talk about a little bit, first make some general remarks, because it's not very often I give to get to give a general lecture. And I'm getting old enough now where I feel like I can sort of give general advice, and so I thought I would talk a, a little bit about, to grad students about how to choose a thesis topic in evolutionary biology or undergrads. And um, just some, some general pointers. Uh, my first rule is to avoid topics studied by Darwin. Um, and, and the reason for this is that Darwin is probably smarter than you are. <laughs> and, so, and, he's, and, and, and so if you take a topic that he's studied, he's probably said some, he's probably made conclusions about it more eloquently than you will manage to do so. So that means uh, no, can't study natural selection, just don't do it. Um, human evolution, no. And, for what, and most importantly, do not study the taxonomy of barnacles. Okay, he spent a lot of time on that. So um, this is pretty much everything, so I guess it means uh, 
So first rule. Um, second rule, um, avoid topics that are hopelessly intractable. And so um, um, Doug Fatuma had this nice line in, his, in a, book, a book review he wrote back in 1983. It was about a book on speciation that had just come out in editor volume. And Fatuma said the topic of speciation is more thoroughly awash and unfounded and often contradictory speculation than any other single topic in evolutionary theory. I won't mention the book, but this book was um, absolutely awash with uh, um, um, bad ideas. And, and then Jerry Coyne and Eleanor sort of added to this about uh, 10 years, I guess it was just six years later, students of speciation are viewed as evolutionary biologists, poor cousins, doomed to eternal speculation about um, untestable theories. I should say that things have gotten better since then, but just the general rule, um, um, avoid topics that are hopelessly intractable. Um, and then I guess my rule number three is, it's, it's actually surprising how successful people have been at, when they ignore these rules. Um, um, and so, for example, um, mo many of our most famous evolutionary biologists, Meyer, Dobzhansky, Stebbins, Grant, Stebbins, of course, of UC Davis fame, um, um, all um, studied speciation and have done fairly well uh, by doing so. I also should point out that there's no other topic in evolutionary biology where you can be wrong about 50% of the time and still become famous. So think about that. So well, if all else fails, um, um, this is after you get your, your um, you might be able to do this with undergraduates, but after you get your thesis done, um, one way to, to manage is just to recruit well. The, the key thing is to find students that are smarter than you, but they don't know it, okay? And, and this is the strategy I've taken during my career is to um, uh, uh, recruit well. So um, many of the, the things that I talk about today, of course, have been, the ideas have been by students and postdocs, and they've uh, made many of the, the discoveries. So when, when typically you see a, a talk about um, biodiversity or about evolutionary biology, there's usually often there's this slide showing all the spectacular phenotypic diversity of life. And it is spectacular. However, one of the things that Dobzhansky pointed out is that there is another striking fact that's almost as um, interesting as the diversity itself. And the fact that is, is this is the discontinuity of organic variation. That is, is that the diversity of life seems to be separated into groups, and we typically call these uh, species. And Ernst Meyer, of course, came up with the biological species concept that is most widely used in, in evolutionary biology. Systematists don't necessarily like it that much, but in general, um, um, folks who are studying the processes of speciation find it convenient to use this, this, this um, uh, concept because it provides a focus for our study. And he um, defines species, of course, as groups of naturally interbreeding populations which are reproductively isolated from other such groups. And it probably would be best to say that they're at least partially reproductively isolated from other such groups. And so when we study speciation, uh, we're thinking about speciation, at least in this talk, I'll be thinking about speciation and t discussing it as the evolution of reproductive barriers. Um, in, in the sense that speciation results from the evolution of traits that prevent or at least reduce gene flow between coexisting taxa and separate uh, populations into two distinct gene pools. And I think in your introductory biology text, you've all sort of been introduced to the various kinds of reproductive barriers, so I won't spend too much time on doing this, but um, um, as we usually think about reproductive barriers that act before mating. Um, this would be behavioral isolation, of course, and that's when uh, potential mates meet, but for some reason don't mate because they don't find each other attractive. Um, habitat isolation, this is where potential mates are actually found in different, um, uh, are, are adapted to different habitats, and so typically they don't meet. And then, of course, we have a lot of uh, uh, types of reproductive barriers that occur after mating but before fertilization. Um, one of them is, is fairly well known, is called gametic competition, where sperm or pollen uh, from one species actually outcompete the pollen from the other species. And then much of what uh, occurs after mating but before fertilization is cryptic choice. Typically females um, will choose uh, pollen or, or, or sperm from one uh, male over another. 
And then after fertilization, we have a number of different kinds of hybrid dysfunctions, um, hybrid inviability, hybrid sterility, hybrid breakdown, and of course, even um, um, extrinsic um, uh, ecological isolation where the hybrids are less fit in parental habitats. <coughs> so just to go through, the, again, the textbook view of how speciation occurs, um, the step one is a population of organisms inhabits a given region. And then typically what we think happens is that the population is subdivided by a reproductive barrier. And in fact, one of the big controversies that has gone on for the last century and a half is, is whether geographic isolation is actually necessary for speciation. I think now we know it's not necessary, but it still happens most of the time. And so this is, is what usually happens. The separated uh, subpopulations change genetically, and reproductive isolation typically evolves as a byproduct of, of divergence, um, either through drift or through natural selection. And then if there's been a long enough time that when the subpopulations expand, their geographic distributions come into contact, it's found that they actually can no longer exchange genes, or at least that they are partially reproductively isolated and now are evolving independently, um, and thus are a good species. So this is what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm going to be talking about sort of three issues. One is the nature of species. And um, this topic is simply asking the question is whether species are biologically real entities. And we're focusing on plant species. Zoologists have never really had a problem with this. But botanists have often assumed that species are actually simply artificial constructs of the human mind rather than actually being biologically real entities to study. I'm also going to talk uh, about sexual selection. Um, we know we've known for, for um, two or three decades that sexual selection plays a major important role in animal speciation. However, as uh, only a decade or two ago, botanists were still asking whether or not sexual selection actually existed in plants. I'm going to argue that sexual selection is probably more important in plant speciation than animal speciation, and it's a major driver. And then finally, I'm going to end by talking about speciation genes. And these are simply genes that contribute to these reproductive barriers. And I'm going to ask what these genes can tell us about speciation. And do they reveal any differences between plants and animals and how uh, speciation occurs? So Darwin as with every topic, he had, a, oh, he had multiple opinions about the nature of species. In some places, he, like here, he says that um, from these remarks, it will be seen that I look at the term species as one arbitrarily given for the sake of convenience to a set of individuals closely resembling each other and that it does not essentially differ from the term variety, which is given to less distinct and more fluctuating forms. That's a sentence. I had to do it in a single breath. Um, it's a very long and... Darwin was very good at making these, these um, um, incredible sentences. But here you can see that he's um, questioning the idea that, species, that a species was any more real than a variety and that questioning the reality of species. Um, in fact, but in other places, even in The Origin of Species, Darwin sort of seemed to accept the, the, the reality of species. And um, interestingly, some zoologists like Meyer accused botanists of uh, poisoning Darwin's mind about the nature of species. So it's, he seemed to have two different views about it. Um, so, of course, Ernst Meyer, uh, in fact, one of the big differences, I think, between the neo-Darwinian synthesis and the sort of original views of Darwin were in the area of speciation and in terms of the biological species concept. And Meyer very much felt that the non-arbitrariness of the biological species concept was due to the internal cohesion uh, uh, of the gene pool. And in contrast, this is, was the prevailing uh, view of, of, of botanists, uh, stated here quite succinctly by Don Levin. Um, plant species are simply utilitarian uh, mental constructs. So there have been a number of different um, kinds of information that have been put forward to try to distinguish whether or not plant species really are real entities or whether they're simply um, um, mental constructs. And this is kind of important, I think, because a lot of us spend a lot of time studying speciation. And obviously, it's not a very interesting topic if we're studying sort of 
the origin of mental constructs in our own minds, it becomes less appealing um, as a topic. And so it's something that, that has sort of bothered me ever since I was a grad student. And Meyer tried to settle this question. He was always frustrated by the fact that botanists didn't necessarily, um, many botanists, if not most botanists during the latter part of the 20th century, didn't accept the biological species concept. And so he took a, 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 the Concord Township flora. So a flora is simply all of the plants from a given geographic region. The Concord Township flora is just a small flora in Connecticut that's very well um, collected. And he essentially leafed through all of these specimens in the Concord Township flora. And he eyeballed them and asked whether the species were distinct or not. And um, he said that 83% um, of the flora was morphologically well-defined, relatively uniform, and sharply set off against all other species, so good species. So that's pretty good. Um, botanists weren't so sure about this analysis because there were no stats. Um, uh, Meyer clearly had an ax to grind. Um, he was a, a, a bird systematist, not a botanist. But um, um, so Lucinda McDade did a, a, a similar study. She's the scientific director at the Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Garden, except she focused on botanical monographs. And botanical monographs are simply all the, sp the species within a particular group, usually a genus. And, and she just reviewed what the botanical monographers said about species. And they said that about 7% uh, uh, of species from 104 botanical monographs were reported as problematic. And so again, both of these kinds of data would suggest that most plant species actually are real and are good species. Um, but these arguments were criticized in two different ways. Um, it was pointed out that the assessments were largely subjective. Um, in one case, it was Meyer that was doing the, uh, providing the subjectivity. In the other case, it was the, each of the botanical monographers. And then it's also been pointed out that the human mind is very adept at classification. Um, this was obviously a very important trait when, um, during hunter-gatherer societies, you didn't want to collect a poisonous plant or misidentify a, a plant or a poisonous mushroom. And, and the, the example that's often given, of course, is the rainbow, which is a continuous spectrum of light, but the human mind automatically divides it up into distinctive colors. So another kind of evidence that was put forward was evidence from folk taxonomies. And the idea here was is that um, if we compared the taxonomies of indigenous people with the taxonomies of, of, of a trained taxonomist, Western trained taxonomists, with very different cultures and very different ways of identifying taxa, that if there was um, um, concordance between those two taxonomies, this would suggest that the species were real or that these categories were real. And this was applied initially by Meyer and then Diamond in New Guinea. And you can see that there was quite striking concordance, 70 to 90 percent between the indigenous taxonomies and the Western taxonomies, uh, 80 percent for frogs, and uh, 95 percent for reptiles. So animals uh, uh, performed very well. In comparison, if you looked at plants, it was found that in the first study that was done of the uh, Celtal uh, uh, people in southern Mexico, it was found that there was only 61 percent correspondence between the uh, indigenous uh, taxon the taxonomy of the, of the folk taxonomy and the Western taxonomy. But then in a more recent study, there was found there was 88 um, percent um, concordance between the taxonomy of the Dai people in southern China and uh, the Western taxonomy. So again, there's fairly strong evidence that both plants and animals are fairly good species. They're using this criteria um, as evidence. But again, this was criticized by the fact that, yes, we might have different cultural backgrounds or training, but we all are humans and have similar neurological processes, so we're likely to classify things the same way. And, and there is some truth to that. Again, think about how people classify animals. They mostly think about shape and size, regardless of whether you're trained uh, or a Western taxonomist or an indigenous person. In plants, almost all botanists, regardless of where they are, focus on floral uh, characters. So a few years ago, we decided to um, um, take a look at applying statistics to the question. And there's actually a branch of, of taxonomy that was intended to do this. It was called numerical taxonomy. It was originated in the 1950s and 1960s. And this taxonomy, which um, lost out to phylogenetic systematics for good reasons, 
um, um, had its, as it was trying to make taxonomy objective. And essentially what was done is that you were supposed to measure as many traits as you possibly could, weight them all exactly equally, and then ask, um, um, and, and then uh, look at the phenotypic variation of those taxa. And, um, and these methods that were developed by numerical taxonomy are still used today, even if it's no longer used as a basis of classification. And so we did a survey of about 200 numerical taxonomic studies. Again, we focused on plants because plants are, it's botanists who worry about the nature of species, not so much zoologists. But we did include some animal studies for comparative purposes. And we asked two very simple questions. We asked, is phenotypic variation continuous or discontinuous? And so what we're really asking is, um, when we see discrete entities in nature, are they really discrete or is our mind somehow fooling us? And, and then second, we asked, do these phenotypic discontinuities, if they exist, do they con con accord well with species taxa? And I've given an example of what the data looked like from a um, Scottish medieval pottery. It's called Scottish whiteware. And um, essentially, um, this is just a, a discriminant analysis of more, the morphology of Scottish pottery. And what it shows is that Scottish pottery from the same geographic regions tends to be similar in morphology and shape. And if this was a plant example, we would probably call each of these you know, a different species and maybe this one a hybrid. So that's the kind of data that's out there. And these statistical methods have gotten a lot better over the past uh, 20 to 30 years. Um, but the, the results are, are still fairly easy to interpret, even in the comparing the, the more earlier studies with the more recent ones. So what we found was is that um, in most cases, um, phenotypic variation is not continuous. So Dobzhansky was right. Um, one of the striking aspects of organic diversity is that it is dis are the discontinuities. They're not just figments of the human mind. They really are real. The surprising thing that we found, though, and I think everyone probably would have guessed that, um, the, the surprising thing, though, that we found was that the correspondence between the species taxa, the, the species named by taxonomists, and these phenotypic clusters turned out to be quite low. It was actually only 54%, which really was, was quite low and worried us. And so um, when I first gave this talk a number of years ago, I was criticized. I said, well, um, people only apply numerical taxonomic methods to problematic taxa. So I took all the problematic taxa out, and the correspondence only goes up to 66%. So the correspondence is not very good. And if you ask why, we get this lack of correspondence. It turns out, you know, we think about taxonomists as being lumpers or splitters, and some of you may have done taxonomic work. And um, our data would suggest that um, the disagreement between the phenotypic clusters and species tax is almost always due to splitting. It's about 88%. So if we were to take these data, we would say that most taxonomists are splitters, um, that they over-differentiate taxa. However, it also might be, and I think that this is probably true, it turns out there are a lot of traits that are not easily transferable into, um, um, that are not easily scorable and transferable onto a, a computer data sheet. And I think that maybe taxonomists are actually seeing sort of the early stages of speciation that are not easily captured in, in a phenotypic analysis. So it might not be that they're splitting, but actually that they're recognizing um, early diverging forms. Uh, that will go on to become good species. So what actually ta causes taxonomic problems? Well, um, the most important thing is, is that taxon doesn't matter. Um, whether you're an animal, a plant, or so forth, um, it doesn't make any difference. In other words, plant species are no worse or no better than animal species in terms of this correspondence between uh, phenotypic clusters and species taxa. In terms of mating systems, it turns out asexual reproduction is, is quite important. And the reason we think this is is that asexual reproduction provides a means for stabilizing hybrid genotypes. And so they sort of bridge the gaps between otherwise distinct taxa. Life history doesn't make a difference. Polyploidy makes a big, uh, causes problems. Um, and this, again, I think is because, again, polyploidy results in the establishment or fixation of these um, um, hybrid genotypes and thus uh, bridges the gaps between otherwise phenotypically distinct taxa. Interestingly, hybridization alone makes no difference. And we've always 
taxonomists and, and the evolutionists have always blamed hybridization as being responsible for fuzzy species boundaries. And it looks like it's only when it's combined with a polyploidy or mating system that established those intermediate genotypes um, that hybridization is a problem. Otherwise, it looks like that the hybrids may simply be back crossed back into the gene pools, be selected against, or in fact, they might even lead to reinforcement or character displacement actually increasing the, the, the phenotypic divergence between uh, hybridizing taxa or sharpening those differences. It also could be that this is just ascertainment bias. Maybe there is an effect. And that what, we're, what the problem is is that um, we can only detect hybrids between taxa that are distinct to begin with. And so that's why it doesn't have an effect. And I, I don't know. Now, you would think that, well, it looks like species are real, but um, uh, some botanists uh, um, suggest that actually, yes, there are phenotypic discontinuities in nature, but these actually don't correspond to reproductive discontinuities. That is, they actually don't correspond well to species and to biological species in nature. And so we decided to address this question as well. We just asked whether these phenotypic, the discontinuities we see in phenotype actually do correspond to uh, reproductively independent lineages. And to do this, again, we did a literature survey. And all we did was we uh, calculated a compatibility index where we compared interspecific compatibility with intraspecific compatibility. And we simply asked, and by the way, if you get a compatibility of index of one, all that means is that inter and intraspecific compatibility are the same. There's no reproductive isolation. Whereas on a, in a given study uh, uh, with a CI of about 0 0.8, that meant typically that would lead to significant isolation. And here are the results. Remember, we're only looking at intrinsic reproductive barriers, not extrinsic barriers, OK? We're not looking at behavior or anything like that. But if we just look at these compatibility alone, this reproductive compatibility alone, the greatest um, fraction of species taxa that represent reproductively independent lineages turn out to be plants rather than animals. So not only, now, if we brought in things like behavior and other reproductive barriers, I think all of these bars would probably be as above 0 0.8. But the bottom line is, is that it seems that plant species actually are probably just as good as animal species. And in both in terms of the uh, amount of the distinctness of the species in terms of phenotype and in terms of the correspondence with uh, reproductive uh, uh, isolated lineages. So sort of to conclude from this section is, is Jared Diamond and a number of other uh, zoologists have accused botanists of being overly influenced by taxonomic horror stories. And I hate to say this, but I think that they're absolutely right. And one of the, the best examples of a taxonomic horror story is this Crepus. This was put forward by Babcock, Ernest Babcock of UC Berkeley fame, who wanted to make Crepus the original Drosophila. It failed in part because of this, um, these horrible agamic complexes. And, so, and yet, um, Apomixis only occurs in 1% of plant species. So I think that we stand, we are, we're accused by zoologists of focusing on taxa like this, and I think that, that they're absolutely right. So now I'm going to move on to talk about sexual selection. And again, I'll, talk, I'll start with Darwin. And Darwin distinguished between sexual and natural selection, pointing out that we are only concerned with uh, sexual selection, this depends on the advantage which certain individuals have over others of the same sex and species solely in respect to reproduction. So we're only interested in, in selection um, uh, of just in terms of, of when there's differences in mating success only rather than in survival or viability. And we know of spectacular examples of sexual selection in animals. Um, here's a, a picture of a hummingbird, and you can see the these tail feathers that make the hummingbird much more attractive to females um, that certainly probably reduce its, its um, um, viability and survivorship. 
And so if we want to define sexual selection, the easiest one is actually the definition put forward by Darwin that was simplified a little bit by Steve Arnold, just selection that arises from differences in mating success. And the nice thing about this uh, particular definition is that it can be easily applied to both plants and animals. And in plants, the strongest selection is probably due to competition among males for ovules, and we'll call this pollen competition, that is competition among pollen grains for ovules. And the, um, now, again, we had a, a, a very important influence on the idea, this de development of this idea from a zoologist, Daniel Ortiz Barrientos. He's now at the University of Queensland. He was a postdoc in my lab. And Daniel was a Drosophila uh, population geneticist before coming to my lab, and I converted him to plants. And, and you know, um, Daniel um, suggested that, uh, that pollen competition could lead to the accumulation of genetic differences between populations and that these differences could affect compatibility among populations. And he suggested that one way we could test this idea was by looking at uh, different plants that varied in ovule number. So ovules are, go on to form seeds. They're sort of the equivalent of an egg in an animal, although they, they're more complicated than that. Um, they contain the egg cell. And so, for example, here's a pepper which has many ovules these little white or green things here. And so he would expect that there would be very weak competition because every pollen grain essentially could have its own ovule. Whereas if you have something like an avocado with a single ovule, there's going to be a lot of competition to fertilize that one ovule. And so he su suggested that the strength of sexual selection could vary depending on ovule number. So this was, the, was our basic hypothesis, was that if we have strong sexual selection, um, well, if we have few ovules, we'll have strong sexual selection, and this is going to lead to um, um, uh, low F1 seed set and high levels of reproductive divergence. Um, whereas if we have weak, many ovules, we expect to have weak sexual selection, um, high F1 seed set, and very weak reproductive divergence. And so we did a comparative analysis. We actually took that same data set that I had produced for looking at um, the biological reality of species, that data set I showed you previously, and we just examined ovule number among all of those different plant families, we had, those plant tax that we had originally examined for reproductive compatibility. And what you can see here is there's a very strong result. If you have few ovules, you have strong reproductive isolation, and many ovules, you get much weaker reproductive isolation. And if we look at this across different life histories, it turns out it's not affected by life history. We see the same pattern over and over again. Uh, with annuals, again, with few ovules, you see stronger isolation than when you have many ovules. Same things with perennials and woody taxa. We also find that it's not, um, um, there's not a phylogenetic. It's not, when we look at different families, we see the same pattern over and over again. Here's the Onagraceae. Um, Plantigonaceae, Polymoniaceae. So um, um, we're now running an analysis that's fully controlled for, for phylogeny, and again, we do see the same um, effect. Uh, here's a within genus example from Silene. Um, this is a genus that varies uh, strongly in ovule number, and again, you can see that if you have very few ovules, you have almost complete reproductive isolation. Many ovules, you have weak reproductive isolation. And uh, Daniel went on, um, um, he thought, and, and so we discussed this quite a bit, um, he suggested that maybe we should be able to see this in terms of differentiation within a species. In groups where we have few ovules, um, different, uh, they should become genetically different more quickly than groups with many ovules. And again, that's what we find. Again, we expect pollen competition to act at nuclear loci, not at cytoplasmic loci, so we expect to see the pattern in nuclear loci and not in cytoplasmic loci or maternally inherited loci. And that's exactly what we find. Again, uh, when we have fewer loci, we get greater differentiation among populations. And we have many ovules, we get uh, less differentiation among populations at nuclear loci. So I want to, to, to emphasize that this is all correlative. We actually haven't been able to prove anything. We don't know for sure that this is the result of pollen competition. There may be other, some other correlate, correlation that we're unaware of. But right now, it looks like that 
sexual selection may play a really important role in driving uh, speciation in plants. And it's interesting that in plants, most genes actually are expressed in ovules. In animals, typically very few genes are expressed in sperm. So you could see how uh, pollen competition could have a large effect on divergence, whereas you might expect a much smaller effect on genomic divergence of, of sperm. And finally, um, the earliest reproductive barriers that we see in sunflowers, which I study, turn out the earliest ones are almost always habitat divergence. We get local adaptation. But the next thing that follows right after that is conspecific po pollen precedence. For example, this is probably the earliest diverging incipient species that we're working on. It's been um, isolated no more than 10,000 years, probably more like than 2,000 years between the, um, the, the, the dune and non-dune populations that occur side by side. We've done coalescent simulations. Uh, they're probably no more than five to 10,000 years old. And we're, we see no intrinsic postzygotic barriers except some individuals now are already almost exclusively prefer pollen from other individuals in their own local population. Some individuals do not, so it's still segregating. But it looks like that this reproductive barrier um, evolves very, very quickly. And of course, sunflowers, remember, if you've eaten a sunflower seed, there's a single ovule per flower. So we expect sexual selection to be important. So the last uh, topic I want to, to address today is um, speciation genes. And, what can, and, and the question, of course, is what can genes that underlie reproductive barriers tell us about uh, speciation? And for many years, I think it's been viewed that, that um, well, before I, I talk about this, I should define what a speciation gene is. Um, I call it a gene that contributes to the splitting of two lineages by reducing the amount of gene flow between them. And it's quite clear that the term barrier gene is, is more accurate. Um, in fact, Jerry Coyne has accused me of um, um, making a political statement by calling these a speciation genes. Um, and he's right, but you know, I'm a botanist and I want zoologists to read my stuff. And so if I just put a barrier gene in them, I didn't think anyone would read it. So we call them speciation genes. Um, but anyways, the reason that we don't use barrier genes is not just the political statement, but also the fact that if you Google barrier genes or look it up on Web of Science, um, the first hit is these genes that um, form that are involved in barriers to nutrient absorption by the small intestine. And so that's my excuse for using the term speciation gene rather than barrier gene. It's a little more warm and fuzzy or less, um, yeah. Um, so again, Darwin um, um, had something to say about um, the evolution of hybrid incompatibilities. And he said that the sterility of hybrids, it's often been said that, uh, that, that Darwin did not understand um, how hybrid incompatibilities arose. Um, that is why hybrid sterility or hybrid inviability arose. But he actually, he did understand it. He just couldn't figure out the genetic mechanism. Um, because he hadn't seen uh, Mendel's papers on, 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 on genetics. But he writes that the sterility of hybrids could not possibly be of any advantage to them and therefore could not have been acquired by the continual preservation of successive, successive profitable degrees of sterility. I hope, however, to be able to show that sterility is incidental to other acquired differences. And so basically he's saying exactly what we say today and that is that these hybrid incompatibilities arise as a byproduct of other differences, um, typically uh, natural selection, but sometimes um, um, drift. So I think, so it wasn't until the 20th century that um, a genetic mechanism was put forward for sort of understanding the evolution of hybrid incompatibilities. I think many of you probably know this mechanism. It was independently discovered by the three, one of the three of the greatest geneticists of the 20th century, Bates and Dobzhansky and Muller, and so they're called BDM incompatibilities. And it's a very simple model. Um, you have uh, step one, you start off with separated subpopulations, change genetically. So the idea is if you have two loci, it doesn't necessarily have to be a two locus model, but typically this is what um, um, is assumed. You then have a, a mutation in these geographically isolated populations. You have the A1 uh, a gene mutates to A2, the B1 gene mutates to B2. You get the establishment of these different mutations. And then when the subpopulations are reunited and you get hybrids uh, between individuals of the two populations, they're incompatible because A2 has never been tested against B2. And so you get a, a hybrid incompatibility. 
And so there's no, what's important about this model is you don't have to go through an adaptive valley in order for the establishment of, of um, a hybrid incompatibility. That is, you don't have to have natural selection for sterility and viability. There isn't none. Um, it's only when you bring these uh, uh, populations back together that you see the expression of sterility and viability. Um, so we did a, um, um, a review of recently of speciation genes in plants. And um, it's interesting that um, pretty much all of the genes that have been, speciation genes that have been published in Science and Nature all have been from animals. Um, the plant genes have gotten almost no press at all, but a lot of them exist. And part of this is not because botanists, because the editors of Science and Nature um, prefer zoological studies. It's just that many of the speciation genes in plants were actually cloned for other reasons, for, because they, un, they, they were responsible for other phenotypes that were uh, of interest for other reasons. And the important thing to note here is, is that all of the hybrid incompatibilities caused by these genes turn out to be consistent with the BDM model. There are no situations we're able to find where, where the, um, the establishment of the uh, incompatibility had to go through um, a um, sort of adaptive valley. There were no situations. All of them were consistent with this Bates and Dobzhansky Muller model. So this is an example where a theory really has predicted what's been found. Um, however, there were a lot of different ways you could do this. You didn't necessarily follow the classic BDM model. For example, um, often what happened fairly frequently, you got the divergent resolution of duplicate, duplicate genes. For example, this is the one speciation gene from plants that was actually published in Science. Um, it's a case where there was the divergent resolution of a duplicate gene that specifies an amino acid um, this is hist so this gene, this enzyme is, is um, necessary for producing L-histidine, which is a critical amino acid. If you don't have it, you're inviable, you die. And so it's, it's duplicated in Arabidopsis. And so what happens is, is that if you have a duplicated gene here, instead of having two different kinds of genes, you have a gene duplication. If the one gene is, is silenced in one lineage, the other gene is silenced in the other lineage, you then have um, um, produce hybrids, and in your F2 generation, there are going to be some individuals that don't have a functional gene. Those individuals are inviable, and this is exactly what was found for this gene in Arabidopsis, as well as for this mitochondrial ribosomal protein in, in, in rice. You can also actually have two different mutations in one lineage, rather than having one mutation in one lineage and the other mutation in the other lineage. Um, in this case, this is a, a tomato example involving two disease resistance genes. And here you have A1 mutating to A2, and then uh, B1 then mutates to B2, and you actually have a hybrid incompatibility um, simply because of the result of these two separate uh, mutations in the same uh, lineage. You also can have, now most of the time when we think about BDM compatibilities, we think that they're going to involve two different genes. This is actually not necessary. It's usually what happens because you're more likely to have mutations in two separate genes. You have a single gene that interacts with 100 loci. There's more likelihood that you'll have separate mutations in, in one of those 100 loci than another a mutation in the same gene. But this is not necessary. For example, at the S5 gene, you actually can get the same uh, happening where the A1 allele mutates to A2 in this geographically isolated population, A1 to A3 here. And then up here, A2 and A3 have never um, seen each other. They're incompatible and can result in, in sterility. So what kinds of genes actually underlie hybrid incompatibilities? And um, I've, this is my only one sort of popular reference, and it's very obscure. My wife is my joke manager, and she tells me I shouldn't use this one. It's, yeah. But anyways, do you remember Forrest Gump? And he said that life was like a box of chocolates. You know, everyone was a surprise. And um, that's really the way it's been for animals. It's been really great. I think the zoologists have had a great time with speciation genes. Um, first of all, there was an oncogene. And then there was a homeobox gene. And then there was a nuclear pore protein, uh, a MIB-related transcription factor, chromatin binding. Uh, JY alpha, which is a transmembrane protein. I'm going to stop there, but there are more. Each of them basically has been different, although these nuclear pore proteins are showing up a little bit more commonly than we might have initially expected. 
also mitochondrial DNA. But in general, it's been great for zoologists. They find a different one every time. It's been lots of nice surprises. In botanists, no. Plants tend to be very predictable based on the incompatibility phenotype. And in some ways, this is good. This is what science is supposed to be, right? We should be able to actually make predictions. For example, um, we have hybrid inviability often involves hybrid necrosis. This is work done by uh, in Detlef Feigl's lab and by Kristen Bombley's. And they're finding that over and over again, this hybrid inviability or hybrid necrosis uh, results from disease resistance genes. Also, early on, it has been pointed out that Often you see unilateral incompatibility between crosses between self-incompatible species and self-compatible species. And this typically involves a self-incompatibility locus, not surprisingly. Um, and the, one of the earliest, at least earliest intrinsic reproductive barriers that arises in plants is cytoplasmic male sterility. And over and over again, what we find is, is this is a chimeric mitochondrial gene, uh, causes CMS, and then the restorer, which is the complementary gene, in the BDM incompatibility for CMS turns out to come from this family, the pentatrichopeptide PPR gene family, which actually regulates organelle or gene expression. And this is over and over again, we find the same thing. Okay, so what kinds of mutations underlie um, hybrid incompatibilities in plants? Well, if we look at prezygotic barriers, it's almost it's the majority of mutations are in our regulatory mutations. And this, of course, makes sense, right? Because a lot of prezygotic barriers involve changes in form, in plant form or plant morphology or plant or some behavioral trait. Um, whereas if we look at also the other thing that we find is that loss of function mutations are surprised, are much, seem to be much more important in plants than in animals in terms of contributing to both prezygotic and postzygotic barriers. I think part of this is because of the genetic redundancy of plant genomes. We often have many different uh, copies of a given gene. And then also copy number variation turns out to be extremely impo important in postzygotic isolation. So we often see differences in the numbers of copies of genes. And in some ways, these are some, sometimes related because the, copy, the, the changes in copy number might also, uh, um, um, well, genetic redundancy, I think, contributes to both of these. The greater redundancy of plant genomes leads to higher proportion of loss of function mutations as well as to um, um, copy number variation. So what kinds of evolutionary forces then um, um, sort of, so we're trying to think about, well, what can this tell us about speciation? It can tell us something about the evolutionary forces that drive species differences. And one of the hallmarks of these speciation genes is that positive selection is often uh, you see a, a molecular signature of positive selection when you sequence these things. Often there's a very high rate of non-synonymous substitutions or that we see evidence of a recent selective sweep. Um, in terms of the kinds of, of evolutionary pressures that are leading to positive selection, we often see evidence of genetic conflict. This can be the, uh, conflict between uh, the male and, and like in cytoplasmic male sterility where between the maternal and paternal components of the genome, it can be conflict in terms of, of between the, the male and female um, 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 uh, reproductive proteins and so forth. Um, and we also see strong evidence of sexual selection. Um, interestingly though, there's surprisingly little evidence that ecological selection has resulted in the evolution of hybrid incompatibilities in animals. I think I know of one possible example involving the mitochondrial genome. There might be other examples I don't know about, but so far it seems to seem to me that there's very little evidence that ecological selection has played a strong role in the evolution of hybrid incompatibilities in animals. In contrast, ecological selection seems to be fairly important in producing hybrid incompatibilities in plants, particularly hybrid necrosis. Um, because these are the result of, of um, um, the evolution of disease resistance genes. And then finally, in plants, there are a surprising number of cases where there's, a, there's no evidence of selection. Um, and, and often these are cases where the, um, there's intraspecific polymorphism for the hybrid incompatibility. And it would suggest that perhaps near-neutral processes are playing a larger role in plant uh, speciation than in animals. But at this point, one of the problems, of course, is that a lot of our tests of selection, um, um, it's very difficult for us to detect some kinds of selection or weak selection. So this may turn out to be wrong. Um, okay. So sort of to, to conclude and to wind things up, I thought I would go back to the original title of the talk. <laughs> 
and plant speciation similarities and contrasts in animals. And so are species biologically real entities? And I'm hoping that by the time I retire, most botanists and zoologists will agree that most species really are biologically real entities. Um, and I would like to take a poll when I retire whether we've made this message through. Is sexual selection important in speciation? Um, it clearly is important in, in Drosophila. We think it might be very important in, in plants. And in fact, there are reasons to think that it might be more important in plants than in animals because of the fact that genes, so many genes are expressed in pollen. But right now, our evidence is entirely correlative. We might turn out to be completely wrong. And um, a lot of work needs to be done on this area. If I was to sort of suggest one area that I think has a lot of promise for studying speciation in plants is to look at sexual selection, look at pollen competition, look at, at, at um, um, uh, pollen proteins and so forth. Try to find out why uh, um, call of conspecific pollen precedence arises so quickly and to see whether this really is an important player in, in, in plant speciation. Are BDM incompatibilities mainly a byproduct of selection? The answer, I think, is yes, although there are some cases in plants where we see we don't have evidence for this. And then finally, is ecological selection important in the evolution of hybrid incompatibilities? I should say ecological, selection, ecological speciation is important, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's important in creating sterility or inviability of hybrids. In plants, there is some evidence that ecological selection probably is important. In animals, I think that this is a real question mark, something that we need to figure out. Um, does ecological divergence also lead to the evolution of hybrid incompatibilities and at the same genes that are involved uh, in ecological divergence? So finally, I want to, to, to acknowledge um, um, everyone that's involved in this. Uh, Eric Bach, Troy Wood, Daniel Ortiz, Barrientos, and Ben Blackman, all are, are folks in my lab that played a large role in developing these, these topics. And then, obviously, the funding agencies that have kept me alive for many, many years. And then my lab, as you can see, they've uh, uh, turned rather hostile recently. So uh, thank you very much. Well, I'm assuming that with this conflict driven, if you're, you're conflict, you get the reproductive isolation because of the rapid evolution of those proteins in geographically isolated populations. Yeah, but like with the CMS, we think that what happens is that you know you start with right, some population right. that's from after that you maybe go through some kind of phase where you Oh, actually, I think that the well, we'll have to talk about this. I think that the story of how CMS um, evolves is backwards from. If you actually read, it's a complicated story. We should talk about this. I write about it in that paper. Is there reasons to think that, um, that the traditional way that CMS evolves is actually might not be, um, when you look at the molecular evolution picture, it may not be um, um, exactly the way the, the textbooks say. With that said, um, I, you know, the, the, um, um, the, I haven't, uh, yeah, Eve, you should never ask me questions. Um, we'll have to talk about this later. Um, I think that is an interesting point, is whether or not these uh, genetic conflict stories actually um, um, do represent um, um, true, um, represent exceptions to how BDM um, incompatibilities evolve. I don't think that they do, but it is selfish elements, and so you can um, obviously produce sterility even though it reduces the fitness of the population as a whole. So. Yeah, so what we've done is we've simply looked at the number of ovules per flower. 
um, and uh, which would, in general, be the number of ovules per fruit. Um, one would certainly think that um, if a plant produced many, many fruit, that there would be you know weaker selection. But in all of our stuff, we've just looked at simply the number of ovules per flower. And um, in fact, one would think that pollen ovule ratio might be the best predictor. But actually, pollen ovule pr ratios don't predict um, um, uh, uh, compatibility as well as simply ovule number. So. Could you uh, comment on mechanisms that might be common to hybrid incompatibilities and, and heterosis? <laughs> so, um, the mechanisms that might be common to hybrid incompatibilities and heterosis, I'll talk about heterosis first since that's something we're very interested in. Um, so it looks to me at least like that heterosis is very much a, has a pluralistic explanation that there are a number of ways you can get to the same place. And it looks like that um, the different, you know, they have these dominance models and over dominance models and also there are these dosage models and all of them actually do seem to be explanatory. In our lab, we've been finding that, um, you know, we've been working with um, the, the gene FT, which causes, in heterozygous states, causes uh, heterosis in sunflowers as well as Arabidopsis. So it's clearly a very much an overdominant model. We're guessing, though, that, um, um, that this will result in the up or down regulation of the same growth pathways that some of these other mechanisms do. And so I think we're still a long ways from actually understanding, though, why we get um, um, heterosis. There do seem to be some um, and that was a terrible answer, but I don't think we actually know sort of a, a true, we are finding that FT um, has, we found two cases, Arabidopsis and Sunflower, where this one gene, FT, which is the, is the sort of um, florigen gene, uh, when it's, uh, you get heterozygosity between a loss of function mutation and a uh, wild type allele, you get uh, heterosis and Arabidopsis, you get these monster little Arabidopsis seedlings, it's really crazy. And uh, sunflower, the same thing. It also has been found separately by Zach Lipman and Danny Zamir and Tomato. On the other hand, you have the maize stories and the uh, Arabidopsis stories with, you know, sort of the upregulation of growth pathways and so forth. So I'm, I, I'm not going to, to try to say which one is right. I think that all of them occur. In terms of, of hybrid incompatibilities, um, the real patterns seem to be that um, disease resistance genes seem to play a large role. Um, obviously, cytoplasmic male sterility is something that happens um, um, fairly quickly. In terms beyond that, um, there's often genes involved in, like, um, involved in maternal effects. Um, genes seem to play a large role. Luca Kamai has, has shown that. Um, um, genes that are um, under sexual selection seem to play a role. But there's no sort of, in terms of a mechanism, I would say, uh, very rapid uh, balancing selection seems to, the, the surprising thing is it doesn't seem to be divergent natural selection as much as it seems to be balancing selection or some kind of selection that um, um, genetic conflict or frequency dependent selection that makes proteins evolve rapidly seems to be the, the, the hallmark of hybrid incompatibility. So rather than just divergent selection per se, um, I guess that's the best I can do with that, that question. Is yeah. that fitness associated with the um, uh, sexual selection in plants. Otherwise, what's the advantage in uh, having sexual selection in plants? Is it uh, uniform within a, within a plant or a tree which produces large number of ovules, uh, single ovules, mm -hmm. but is it uniform toward the plant, toward the species? No, I don't think that sexual selection doesn't, I don't think, provide an advantage for the species. It's simply um, for individual males, um, they want to be able to do better than other males in terms of fertilizing offspring, and that leads to very rapid evolution, presumably, of, of proteins involved in, in fertilization and in pollen tube growth. Um, I don't think it, it, certainly I don't think it helps the species in any way. It might, I suppose, allow those spe species to outcompete pollen of that species to outcompete another pollen from another species, but usually what happens is, is that females choose as well, and so um, just due to the rapid um, evolution of the pollen um, um, coat proteins or pollen compatibility proteins, that when you have crosses with another species, there's conspecific pollen precedence. So females have, um, there's been enough divergence of those proteins that females are no longer compatible with another species. 
at least in sunflowers, it happens very quickly. Like um, the strongest reproductive barrier in sunflower, once you get, um, is um, in most of the species, turns out to be conspecific pollen precedence. Um, in annuus and pedialaris, two species I work with a lot, it's like, um, it can be as high as 99%. You get 99% fertilization by one species rather than the other. Uh, so please join us for that, and uh, join me in uh, thanking Warren for the talk today.